With the passing of time, accounts of the Second World War Luftwaffe raids on the Supermarine Factory in Southampton in 1940 will vary. A popular myth is that German bombing was so inaccurate that the factory was not hit at all, when in reality on one day in September it is estimated that 70 tons of bombs fell and more than 140 people were killed. Of course, the Supermarine Factory was the home of the legendary Spitfire fighter aircraft that will forever be associated with the RAF's victory in the Battle of Britain during World War II. Testimony to the importance of the Supermarine Works is that after the raid, Lord Beaverbrook, the Minister for Aircraft Procurement, came to Southampton and insisted that the Spitfire must be produced locally in any location where aircraft could be built. Bill Ball was an 18-year-old sheet metal worker at Supermarine when the factory in Wollstone was damaged on the 24th and 26th of September. He said, I'm lucky to be alive. Lots of my mates were killed. The sirens went and we just sauntered across to the shelter and had a game of cards. Then we heard the aeroplane engines. I was the one nearest the door, so I looked out and I saw swastikas, so shouted, Get down quick, boys! We laid on the floor of the shelter with the bombs crashing down around us. The concrete cracked under our stomachs as we lay there. After the planes had gone, we began digging the injured out and bodies. About one quarter of all the workers were killed. But despite the loss of life, production was quickly restarted. Mr. Bull said, We worked flat out. We knew we had to. The Germans were flying over us every day. We could see what was happening in the skies over our head and how important it was to keep building the planes. Luckily, the most important precision machines in the Supermarine factory were virtually undamaged and with their workers were quickly moved to new factories at 28 sites around Southampton. The design office went to the Polygon Hotel, fuselage and jig production went to Seawards Garage and assembly took place at Hanson Dorset Bus Station. Henley's garage also undertook fuselage assembly. Detail fittings etc. took place at the Sunlight Laundry. Lothar's garage became a tool room whereas Short's garage was a machine shop and Western rolling mills were the coppersmiths. Chisnell's garage became a sheet metal and press shop whereas Lingwood Precision owned by Seawards took care of the landing gear. However because of the significance of the Spitfire Production went even further afield to Reading, Hungerford, Newbury, Salisbury and Winchester. In Newbury, Elliott's Furniture Factory was requisitioned, as was Vincent's Garage in Reading. Salisbury's local bus depot was one of seven factories in the city where wings and fuselages were built. Rodney Young was a 17-year-old apprentice at the Supermarine Factory. He recalled... The RAF loaned several Queen Mary trailers and we were helping to load them and going with them to unload at the empty bus station, empty garages. It was a peculiar sort of escape. Don Smith helped build Spitfires and accommodated metal works. He said, we felt we were part of it as we worked away. Our spirit was with the boys up there. By the end of the war, over 8,000 Spitfires were built in this way and taken to airfields for assembly and test flying. Eventually, so many RAF orders were placed that production was spread to additional sites, including Castle Bromwich, near Birmingham. The Spitfire was to remain in production throughout the entire war, with over 22,000 built. It is mainly women and young men working in these dispersal factories in Southampton and the surrounding area who are the unsung heroes because they played a vital role in maintaining production of the Spitfire during a crucial period in the battle for Britain. At that time, the Spitfire touched the lives of every family in Southampton, whether on the ground or in the air.